Whether they're launching t-shirts from a cannon or tackling children, mascots are entertaining crowd pleasers. But in the days of the first mascots, superstition led teams to rally around some questionable good luck charms. Mascots, a topic as harmless and interesting as cardboard. And in such trying times, don't we all deserve something simple? Something happy? No, we deserve nothing. And the dawn of sports mascots can get pretty f***ing dark. So light a torch and follow me into the bowels of sports history. In 1880, La Mascotte, a French opera, premiered in Paris. It's centered around a farmer named Rocco, who is in need of some good fortune. His brother introduces him to a woman who he believes will give him good luck as long as she remains a virgin. She then becomes his mascot. This term was then used to describe people such as Willie Hahn, a boy who spent the 1886 baseball season leading the Chicago White Stockings onto the field, which then became the Americanized version mascot. Voila, a term for human good luck charm is born. That's not objectifying at all and it wasn't reserved solely for little boys and women's virginities either. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it extended to the mentally and physically disabled as well, because back then people were fucking horrible. In 1911, an intellectually slow farmhand named Charlie Faust attended a county fair in St. Louis. It was here that he met John McGraw, manager of the New York Giants baseball team. Charlie told him a story of a fortune teller that predicted he would lead the Giants to a championship. McGraw, being the superstitious type, gave Charlie a tryout. Turns out, Charlie was a real sh baseball player, but McGraw figured he could be a useful mascot. However, he never told Charlie that. He just let him believe he made the team. But he played his part well. His jokes kept the team loose and his pregame antics would entertain the crowds. The Giants even let him pitch a couple of innings for a laugh. Poor Charlie didn't realize both teams were in on the gag, and he was led to believe he was actually a good, professional baseball player. Part of Charlie's prediction actually came true. The Giants became the 1911 National League champs, but they went on to lose the World Series to the Philadelphia Athletics, whose mascot was a hunchback dwarf named Louis Van Zelst. The following year, Charlie continued to believe he was a member of the team, a good one no less, and insisted that he play more. McGraw no longer found the ruse funny and started to worry about Charlie's mental state, so he let him go. Broken-hearted, Charlie moved to Seattle to join his brother. But despite being let go from the team, Charlie couldn't shake the feeling that the team needed him. So he decided to walk all the way from Seattle to Portland in an attempt to rejoin the team for a game. The police picked him up along the way, and after hearing him ramble about being a professional baseball player, decided to send him to a mental hospital, where he was diagnosed with dementia. A year later, he died of tuberculosis in that very hospital. He was 34 years old. I wish I could tell you that's the only sad, f***ed up story about the early days of mascots. I also wish I could tell you he was the first mascot, because that's what this story was supposed to be about. But he wasn't. Superstitious people have been using animals, and sick children, and people like Charlie Faust as mascots since sports began. What I can tell you is that the first person to actually get paid and make a living off of being a mascot was this guy, Max Patkin, the clown prince of baseball whose rubber face and wacky antics entertained baseball fans for 50 years. Feel better? Me neither. Or maybe a little. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's good. That's good.